Hello everybody. Happy Thursday. Hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Um, the funny thing is I was about to talk about fear today. And because I don't know about the rest of your guys' this week, but I have just been confronted with just about every level of fear that has been permeating 2020. Uh, it seems like there's three main things that are showing up as fear. There's, you know, the fear of mortality, which is showing up in fear of a virus and fear of sickness and fear of losing loved ones. There's fear of poverty, which is showing up in a lot of, you know, small businesses struggling, a lot of people freaking out over unemployment benefits and where to find jobs. Uh, there's a lot of fear over control and being controlled, either losing control or being controlled um, by some sinister something or other, whatever agenda it might be, which is causing lots of outrage and rebellion. And sometimes it's actually causing some of those people in control who are losing control to get a lot louder. Uh, and every single one of those hit me this week. Every single freaking one. Um, had a couple of scares, had had some slow days in business. Uh, even had somebody from my past um, call me up and ask me to leave him out of my videos uh, because he would like to remember our prior interactions as happy ones and he didn't want to, you know, hear about my spin or my take or, you know, my experience of uh, the, <laughs> the um, interactions that we had. So every single thing, it seems like fear has just gotten out its megaphone and just shouted into my face this week. If anybody else has had this my heart goes to you so, so deeply. It's not fun. Fear is so not fun. I don't care what, I don't care what Universal Studios or Magic Mountain or any theme park tells you about, oh, come to our Halloween Fright Fest nights. Being scared is no fun. And if you go to those Fright Fest things, I'm very, you know, very proud of you, very happy for you. Don't expect me to join you, ever. <laughs> all that being said, I wanted to talk about all that today and instead got a very, very strong feeling to talk about love. Um, and I think it's honestly because love is real, fear is not. And that is the one of the ultimate truths. Love is in the present. Um, you love so many things in life. You can love a person, you can love an animal, you can love yourself. I hope you love yourself because you are wonderful and so worthy of love, especially your own love. But um, you can even love a good cheeseburger that you're eating at that moment. But fear is never real. Unless you are being chased by a tiger on fire, underwater, or in some other kind of mortal danger, fear exists in the future. It's, as many wise people have called it, false evidence appearing real. Um, but love is, love is real. And we know it every time we experience it. So without further ado, I, <laughs> I remembered a wonderful, wonderful talk from a philosopher, a modern day philosopher, which you know you always imagine them being like beardy Greek guys, you know, talking in like a weird like park somewhere, right? No, um, Alain de Paton, and I swear I'm sorry if I got his name wrong, but I will put the link in the comments. Um, I'll put the link in the bio, the description thing. <laughs> um, it's a really amazing talk and the title of it is, um, or the theme of it is, depending on what you search online, why you will marry the wrong person. Woo, 
cheers for optimism. <laughs> the, I love, I, I just, I do love a good British bit of humor. Um, and B, the main, one of the main points he makes is we do not seek a partner who will not make us suffer. I know we all think we do. I did. Um, in fact, I do remember repeatedly saying, I just want somebody who's not going to cause me this pain. Um, his, his argument is we don't seek people who aren't going to make us suffer to be partners. We seek people who are going to make us suffer in familiar ways, i.e. how we learned to love when we were very young and how we received love when we were very young. For most of, it's, it, for most of us, it's the patterns that our parents raised us with. Um, our parents who were you know, unconditionally loving, but let's face it, none of us are perfect. Um, and all of us have some irritating quirk or some of us have you know, these underlying fears, insecurities, you know, um, mental illnesses, instabilities, addictions. We are all deeply effed up and none of us is exempt. If there is a perfectly sane person in this world, they're the crazy one. But we learn from our parents most often or our primary caregivers, aunts, uncles, grandma, grandparents, foster parents, what have you. We learn a lot about how love works from them especially since they're the ones with us our first, you know, three to four years of life without almost any outside influence unless you've had older siblings. Um, and then we go to preschool and we are quickly taught that we do not know everything like we thought we did. Then there's our friends when we're very young. And again, they've all been raised by other parents who have other quirks. And sometimes we have good experiences of early childhood friendship, sometimes we don't. But the fact is, we all have a very skewed vision of what love looks like. And depending on the kind of growing up that you had those first few years, those patterns will cement themselves in your brain. And whether we know it or not, when we say that you know, I just, I had that instinct. Again, this is something Debaton talks about um, brilliantly. I highly recommend this video and this talk. Um, when we say instinct, really what we're looking for is something familiar. It's why we say, that person just, you feel like home to me. And it's a very, very sweet sentiment. Very deeply kind of uh, red flaggy, if that's a word. Because when we say someone feels like home, we mean they're familiar. And depending on what is familiar to you, you might have a very different view of home versus healthy. Um, I know for me personally, my parents gave me a great example of what love could be. Um, I was an only child, so some of my hangups involve that some, you know, a lot of times I expect unconditional love when maybe I'm making it hard on someone to love me unconditionally. Because my parents did. I was their only, I was their only child. Of course they were going to love me. They had to. Um, but then I got a little older and one of my first best friends uh, lived right next door. Um, and she was one, you know, she was a great, great friend. But I also, you know, I look back and there were a lot of things that she was acting out um, for whatever reason. And I took that on. So I also learned about how to love from her. I learned how to love from some of my other early childhood friends. And so all of these little quirks, all of these little things that I learned and picked up along the way, and also, let me throw this out here, and I've probably thrown it already out there a little. I was a weird kid. 
So also, I got reactions from the other kids in some very unhealthy ways because I'm sitting over here in kindergarten singing Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville when all the other kids were into Britney Spears. I did not make life easy on myself. And so, with all of that said, we will often seek what feels familiar. So for me personally, I, I almost sort of, I don't think I acknowledged the love that my parents showed me as much as I should have because that was a much healthier version, but I always craved the love of my peers more because on some childhood level, you know, I wasn't buying that my parents loved me unconditionally. It was always, uh, again, I was like, you have to love me, I'm your kid. Um, which is a really pessimistic thought for a four to five year old. <laughs> and that's all I've changed that relationship with them. Well, I mean, I've never had a bad relationship with them, but they'll laugh when they see this if they do. <laughs> because I did, I always wrote that off as the love that, you know, I hate to say it, I could take for granted. I knew my parents would love me, so cool. What I really craved was the love of my peers and my friends. So that's what I started chasing. And I'm literally figuring this out in real time as I'm making this video. They always say when you give advice to someone else, you're really giving advice to yourself. Totally. Um, if nobody else watches this, it was still an awesome video for me and my own therapy. But, um, <laughs> I always craved the attention of my peers, which led me to some patterns of chasing the love of people who, you know, maybe aggravated me and bantered with me because I thought that was always kind of that mm, chemistry-ish. I always kind of saw it as a, as a friendly thing because the friends that joked with me when I was a kid, um, some of them were, kids can be mean and some of them did do the mean kid jokes and I was the butt of them. So I, and to anyone listening, um, if you're listening, it really probably wasn't you. I I no longer have any contact with really anyone um, that affected me negatively. So don't worry, I'm not like doing a veiled threat here, or not veiled threat, but a veiled like um, complaint. Veiled insult, veiled insult, I'm not doing any of that. But I did, I chased a lot of, you know, I got bullied when I was a kid, um, because again, I was a weird little kid. Um, and so I chased the love of people who did not love me. I chased the love of people who chose to show love in very unhealthy ways in very manipulative ways, in very catty ways, in very, in the case of my relationships, in very cold and emotionally distant ways. Um, if you can call that showing love, I don't know. Um, and some people do call it showing love and that's, there's no right or wrong in it, but it's just how we have all been programmed to act based on our first impressions in life of love. Which again, is a really bizarrely messed up thing about human psychology. Can we just throw that out there? This is why we're so messed up is because we're learning from a previous generation who was just a little bit more in survival mode than we were. We're trying to heal and take care of all of our emotional stuff when we were taught by generations that we're just trying to survive a depression, just trying to survive a stock market crash just trying to survive a housing market crash. Oh my gosh, no wonder. So I think we should all also take a minute to just be gracious with ourselves, with those who raised us, those who taught us about love, because in the end we're all crazy and it's okay. Um, I know that I'm a girl with blue hair saying it's okay to be crazy, but I really do mean that it's okay to be crazy. So how do we, how do we fix this? 
you know, okay, yeah, we've got this pattern. Yeah, we start seeking out things that are familiar. Yeah, we're not seeking out somebody who won't make us suffer. We're seeking out people who will make us suffer like, like our moms did or our dads or our early childhood friends or maybe our aunts, our uncles, whoever. We're just looking for somebody to replicate that so that we can feel comfortable and we can feel home and maybe it sucks worse than anything but at least it's the devil we know. And that's, guys, this is 2020. This is a time of awakening. This is a time of all of that hidden, dirty, gunky systems and patterns and beliefs and unhealthy and toxicity and, you know, in some cases, corrupt. You know, all of this stuff is whipping itself up to be seen. Why not stop? our own patterns while we're at it because that's the only way the world's going to change is if we change ourselves first. I'll get off my soapbox. Does anyone use soapboxes anymore? I, I, I have never actually seen a soapbox, but I hear that people stand on them to make points. So with that said, I'll get off my soapbox. But how do we break these patterns of seeking out people who will not be not be the best co-pilots in our journey to live our best life. Um, it starts with seeing yourself because a lot of us are chasing and our craving of, of love and attention and affection is really, it's really a symptom of not feeling seen, not feeling heard. Um, and again, I know this one from personal experience. I was a very easygoing, very quiet um, kid. And so when I did speak up, nobody really listened because it was like, Chelsea, what's wrong with you? Why are you so worked up? Because I never spoke. So when I did speak, um, or when I was actually passionate about something and I wasn't just letting it go with the flow, nobody really paid attention. And um, again, if my parents are watching this, you guys were great. I'm talking about the rest of the, the rest of the elementary school kids who now no longer matter, but there we go. Um, so I, for years, wanted so desperately to be seen, to be heard, to be, you know, acknowledged. And here's the funny psychological trick. When we do not process trauma, when we do not process pain, when we do not allow ourselves to feel it, let it go all the way through, and heal it, actually, you know, let it be seen, our brains will tell us to put ourselves into situations where we can repeat as close as we can the event that caused us that pain so that we can relive it and we can bring it to the forefront of our brain and we can process it and then we can move on. But most of us don't, at least not until we've been knocked severely over the head enough to the point where we finally get it through our thick skulls. Uh, again, that was... I know that one from experience. But yeah, we will unconsciously, isn't this freaking crazy? We will unconsciously seek painful situations. And our brain is trying to get us to notice what went wrong here so that we can fix it for good this time. And if we don't listen to that little voice, if we don't know that little instinct is there, we're going to get all kinds of crazy fireworks and sparks and good feelings about people and good, you know, like gut reactions to people that are not good for us at all. Um, you know, it's, it's a really unfortunate stereotype, the girl with daddy issues. It is because it makes it that girl's, it almost makes it that girl's fault which it's not. If anything, the daddy should have daughter issues. I don't know, but there's, I think there's a little bit of that in all of us. That's the other thing is it's not just daddy issues. It's mommy issues, it's friend issues, it's aunt issues, it's uncle issues, it's sister issues, brother issues. 
we all have somebody in our past that we are chasing after unconsciously. So first we have to know that our brain is trying to put us in situations where we can actually process. Then it'll go away and that stress will go away and that's all our brain is trying to do is just help us to be safe. So we see that. And then the hard part, we have to look at ourselves. This is a huge theme in all of my videos and I'm sorry to be so repetitive, but it really does all stem from being able to look inward and say, okay, why do I keep attracting these narcissistic types? Why do I keep attracting addicts? Why do I keep attracting these people who will show me the time of my life for a month and then go cold and distant on me and just keep me twisting in the wind. And it's not a blame thing. That's the other important piece. Do not blame yourself and start going, oh, well, it must all be my fault. I'm attracting this. I'm manifesting this. I guess I got to go read the secret again um, or watch the secret again. Um, no. No we're dealing with little microscopic processes that we haven't understood until very recently. We're dealing with spiritual energies that we haven't looked at in our modern age. We are dealing with so much that is unconscious to us. It's not our fault that we're screwed up, but it is within our power to fix it. Not our fault, but in our power to fix. So now we have to look at ourselves and we have to look at our past and we have to really, and sometimes it's tricky. Sometimes things are so buried and so knotted up. We might've even forgotten some things that were so pivotal in our development that we've shoved deep into a closet um, because they are, a lot of people have a lot of monsters in their closet. And I know that some might feel scarier to look at than others. And I ask you to be courageous in this because if you can look into things that have caused you pain in the past, you will cease to, you will stop looking for them in the future. And after you've done that, and again, that could take holy crap, just a minute of, oh my God, I do remember that one time. <gasps> or it could take a couple years. It really, healing has no timeline. When you look for the healing, you will find it in varying and different ways. Varying and different are the same thing. Chels, come on. But you'll, when you're willing to do the work, you will heal. When you are open to that level of pain that could be lurking behind door number three, you will find healing. Um, highly recommend any professionals that can help you along the way because that's sometimes you also do need somebody who can pull that out of you in the right ways and ask the right questions. Please do. Please find somebody who will help you process in a safe space as well. So now we've seen the mechanism that's causing all of this runaround. Now that we've seen the source of this runaround, the rest is automatic. There, there is no step three. Step three is the world will change around you. All of the people who aggravate you that you used to be attracted to but really just caused you pain they lose their appeal real freaking quick. Um, those red flags, they will start popping out like red lights. I mean, the things you just used to step over, oh, that's not a red flag, that's more of like a red orange. So that's more like a, more like an auburn flag. You know, that's not really a red flag. Those things will glare so brightly at you that it's like the best form of aversion therapy. And once you've learned to say no thank you to the things that cause you pain, 
the even more beautiful part of this whole process is the people who will bring you joy start stepping in I promise even if you're in the camp that's thinking there's nobody out there for me there's nobody that will put up with my crap there's nobody who will find blue hair and tattoos attractive in Tennessee I promise you there is there are friends there are adopted family um, there are co-workers there are pets there are romantic relationships that will start showing up when you start saying I'm better than causing myself pain and I love myself too much to hurt anymore and we might repeat this process over and over again throughout our lives as patterns keep popping up and that's fine once you know how to clear them it gets really easy you go oh, okay crud what's making me do this pattern oh age five carton of milk got it <laughs> and once you do that magical things happen so with that know that if there seems to be a string of pain following you or if you keep attracting these people who cause you absolute anguish or maybe if you just wonder why the heck you keep walking into the same relationship over and over again just with different faces know that your mind is probably trying to put you in those situations and that you know that oh my gosh we just had an instant connection and that instant fireworks fireworks not saying they're bad fireworks can be amazing but if your fireworks have been you know leading you to I grew up out in the desert if your fireworks are leading you to a freaking brush fire every time you might want to look at the kind of fireworks you're buying um, because there is a difference of the quality of fireworks that you can achieve with people so once you learn what your instinct is usually guided by then you learn what programmed those instincts it all falls apart the curtain drops you see the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain is just this weird little old man who's talking into a microphone and suddenly the monsters go away and all of the love and the light that you are so worthy of will come in love yeah I said that right anyway that's about it for tonight just remember you are so worthy of so much so so much that the world has to offer and all you have to do is reach out and accept it have a wonderful night I love you all stay safe stay well I'll see you next time